Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first thing I need to do is just get a bit of an idea. You're all year 12, aren't you? Okay. Who has actually done Islam as so far? Hands up. Okay. Who has not done it? Okay. Those who haven't done it, I can guess I can say anything and you wouldn't know, would you? <laughs> okay. No, seriously. For those that have done it, <coughs> as your person, who has done Aisha? Okay. Who has done Al-Ghazali? <coughs> who has done Sayyid Qutub? Uh, who's done something else? Okay. All right. Majority of you have done Aisha. However, the problem with this session is if I talk too much about a specific person, it doesn't really help those of you that haven't done it. So I'll be making some passing comments to, about Aisha, but I guess I'll be talking in more general terms. Uh, in terms of practice, uh, who has done bioethics? Uh, sorry, ethics. Bioethics. <coughs> uh, sexual ethics? Environmental ethics? <coughs> Good. In terms of practice, who has done Hajj? Friday prayers? Uh, funeral ceremonies? <coughs> okay. <coughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, seriously, do forgive me because I'm not prepared for this, but we'll see how we go. Some general comments, first of all. First thing you need to know, to answer a good HSC question, you do not need to have a lot of content knowledge. Okay? Put up your hand. You've all done past HSC papers? Yes. Okay. Put up your hand if you've seen a question that says, tell me about the life of someone. No. Okay. It's going to say something like, what has been the contribution of your person or the impact of the person? Or whatever. So the actual detail of the person's life is really not that lot of, not that important. However, when I'm marking HSC questions, guess what I'm reading about? The detail of the person's life. That's not the point. Okay. What we're concerned about in the HSC question is that you understand the question and you have the skills to be able to use that information to answer the particular question. Now, as you probably know, most of your HSC questions are not going to be about a particular person or a particular ethics or a particular practice, although there have been some of those. Um, they're more about a general question, which may ask you to look at two or three areas or may not even specify a particular area. It may have a stimulus such as a quotation or whatever. Um, it may have a diagram um, and then you'll have a fairly general response or a general question, okay? So what you need to do is you need to make sure that when you come in, you are prepared for a general question, okay? If you get a particular specific question, that's great. You can use that information. Okay, so let's look at a person. When we come to look at a person, what are the sort of things that we're concerned about? Let me just make a brief uh, look at our sacred text. It says, explain the contribution to the development and expression of Islam of one significant person and analyze the effect of this person. Okay. Doesn't say, tell me about the details of the life, although that is important. How many of you did Aisha? Hands up. Okay. Probably you've got some of the key ideas about the life of Aisha. From our perspective, probably the most controversial or concerning thing about Aisha is what? her age when she was married. Okay, she was nine years of age, which in that particular culture was not particularly an issue. It is for us today. Uh, how old was Aisha when Muhammad died? 18 or 19. So they were married about 10 years, okay? During that time, she became recognized by most Muslims as Muhammad's favorite wife. She was the one that he wanted to spend time with. And when he knew that he was dying, he wanted to spend the time with Aisha and died in her arms. Indeed, he's buried in her room. That's something to think about, isn't it? And um, that's now part of the mosque in Medina. Okay. So as far as most Muslims are concerned, Aisha is a wonderful woman. The mother of believers. Do all Muslims believe that? No. And there's one particular group, a school what we call the Shiite school of Islam that does not. And so they don't actually hold Aisha as someone of uh, significant respect and honor in their religious tradition. 
why? They're the sort of questions we should be asking, not the usual glib information about the details of life, but why is it so? When I was growing up, as you know, right back in those good old days, we had a fellow by the name of Professor Julius Sumner Milner. Anyone remember him? Yay. Why is it so? If you ever look at a YouTube clip, and uh, you'll find him, I think, quite interesting and fascinating. Anyway, so that's the question we should be asking. Why is it so? Why is Aisha significant? Why is she controversial? What has been her contribution and impact on Islam? There are, of course, events in her life, I'm not going to go into detail, the scandal of the slander, the battle of the camel. They ring bells with you, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Okay. Remember the scandal of the slander was the accusation that Aisha may have been unfaithful to Muhammad. And he was urged by his cousin to divorce her. What was the name of his cousin? Ali. Who do Shiite Muslims consider to be the only, of the, only one of the rightful guided caliphs that we should honour? Ali. That's right. And of course, what we find is as the relationship between Ali and Aisha develops, it becomes an antagonistic relationship. So much so that Aisha goes into battle against Ali, the Battle of the Camel, where she's defeated and brought back to Muhammad, uh, brought back to, uh, to uh, Medina. Muhammad was dead at that stage. So we have this ongoing hostility between the two, okay? Now, when she was brought back to Medina, she was never allowed to remarry, okay? She was considered by Islam to be someone that was of such significance that she should not remarry. That's the story, of course, Ali, who was a forthrightly guided caliph, didn't want her to marry, did he? Because if she had children, potential rivals. Okay. So there, I'm sure there's some in palace intrigue, if you like, going on there as well. She, of course, spent her next uh, remaining years becoming a scholar in Islam. She remembered what Muhammad did and said, and so she contributed to the Hadith, which is, of course, the second most significant sacred text in Islam, the sayings, the actions, the teachings of Muhammad, 2,200 odd, very significant contribution. Incidentally, Shiite Muslims don't particularly recognize the Hadith. Pretty obvious why when you think of it. Um, she also was a significant scholar of Islam. She taught 80 of the early scholars of Islam. 25% of Sharia law is considered to have come from Aisha. So it's not surprising that she's a significant person in Islam. Today, women in particular hold her up as a model for Islam, a model of how to live. Uh, educated, intelligent, um, involved in scholarship, so she becomes a model. So they're the sort of things, no matter who your person is, you should be thinking about. Not so much that they were born in the year 632, but what is it that they did in their life that contributed to, to Islam? and had an impact on it. The question you should be asking when you come to your exam paper and as you prepare for it, the question should be asking is, how would Islam be different if this person had never lived? How would Islam be different if this person had never lived? If you can answer that question, you've discovered something about their contribution and their impact to Islam, okay? All right. Any questions on person Aisha? Quite happy for you to ask questions. Okay, ethics. We've done all the ethics, haven't we? Okay, very hard to talk about ethics. What are we going to say about ethics? Firstly, you need to know what Islam teaches about that particular uh, ethical area, be it environmental, be it um, sexual ethics, bioethics. What does Islam teach about that? Secondly, you need to be able to support that with quotations from the Quran. Okay? You must learn one or two verses from the Quran. Okay? Put them in your head, memorize them. Now, in today's culture, because we're very much a literate culture, or probably more a glass culture, uh, with iPads and so on, computers, in today's culture, we tend not to memorize things so much. We don't place an emphasis upon it, but we do. For example, if I said to you, our Father which art in heaven, you would tell me the next line was? Amen. Okay. Did you sit down and learn that off by heart? No. You've memorized it, okay? So you can memorize things, okay? 
You've just shown me that you can do that. Memorize some verses from the Quran and be able to use them in your responses. Now, if you can find verses that can cover a number of areas like religion and peace and so on, that will be to your advantage. It's okay. What were the teachings? Secondly, what, how is that supported by verses from the Quran? Secondly, what examples can I use to illustrate how these um, ethical areas are evident in the life of a believer? Okay, examples. So if you're talking about environmental ethics, you know, look up some organisations that do something and be specific in what they do, okay? If you're looking at bioethics, you know, choose an area like IVF or whatever and think how does Muslim teaching apply to this particular area? Or if you're looking at sexual ethics, um, you know, look at something like you know, homosexuality or marriage or whatever. Be careful not to get sidetracked into controversial contemporary areas, okay? Just because a newspaper says something doesn't mean to say it's important to your particular response, okay? All right, ethics. <clears throat> Thirdly, practices. Okay. Hajj, how many do Hajj? Okay, probably majority. And the other one's Friday prayers. Okay, Friday prayers, all right. Okay. You need to be able to describe the practice, okay? What actually happens when people are involved in Friday prayers or when people are going on the Hajj, okay? What do they do? Um, look at maybe a you know, preparation, for example, for the Hajj, what happens when they go there, getting into their two pieces of cloth, um, traveling from here to there, staying at Mina, all that sort of stuff. So a bit of, bit of description is very helpful. Friday prayers, I don't know much about it, but what they do, okay? Secondly, we need to look at how the practice expresses the beliefs of Islam, okay? Beliefs of Islam. And so uh, Friday prayer, obviously, we're looking at the second of the five pillars in a more focused and expanded event, uh, context. Again, verses from the Quran that can use to be used to support that are going to be helpful. Similarly, um, with Hajj, with pilgrimage, there's a number of areas you can look at. The idea of equality, the idea of uh, forgiveness at the Mount of, of uh, Plain of Arafat, that sort of thing, okay? So looking at picking up some of those key ideas of beliefs. The third thing is, of course, looking at the, of the significance of that practice for the individual, okay? Every event involved, and the fourth one is significance for the community. So every one of these practices is going to have an individual component and a communal component. So for the person that's involved in Friday prayer, it's obviously an act of devotion. It's, uh, it's being there, um, spending some time communing with Allah. For the Hajj, it's going to be things like um, uh, seeking forgiveness things like obedience to the Quran, uh, those kind of individual actions. But of course, both of those are very much communal events. Even in the expression of the second pillar, Salat, uh, during the um, time of prayer, the gestures that are involved includes turning to the right and turning to the left, which is addressing the community, okay? So even when you're praying on your own in, your, in the home, you're doing that. In Friday prayer, there you are with the community. It's a corporate act. Again, on Hajj, you're involved in it as an individual pilgrim, but you are with the community and you share those experiences together. And some of those experiences can be particularly trying. Throwing the stones at the uh, pillars, um, the three pillars, involves a crush of people. Look at some of the documentaries that you can find on the Hajj as people talk about the emotions that they're going through and their feelings of frustration or even anger. But as a community, you can't get angry because it's part of the whole ethos of the Hajj. So as a community, it's something that you are sharing together. It crosses boundaries. And even Friday prayers crosses those kind of boundaries that we all too often put up. Um, racial, cultural, um, and here we are, people gathered, particularly in the Hajj, from all over the world. There's one, uh, there's actually a little National Geographic documentary about uh, an American woman who's involved on the Hajj. 
and she reflects on the attitudes of people towards her. Um, she's obviously blonde and blue-eyed and uh, the kind of feelings and stuff that are there and the fact that she's part of this community and the sense of alienation almost as part of that event. Um, there are some really good documentaries on the Hajas, an English one, uh, which is really good, a few old, years old now, and the one, I think, by National Geographic, which is quite good as well. If at all possible, talk to somebody who's been on the Hajj. You'll find them talking about their experience for themselves, um, which, is a, which is really a way of coming to understand it. So there we have a very brief overview, I'm afraid, and certainly ill-prepared on um, person, ethics and practice. I'll leave you to go away and draw out the implications and um, how that actually applies to your particular area. I just want to say a word or two about HSC questions. Um, then I'm going to have to filibuster for another 10 minutes or something. Okay. All right. One, do not go into the HSC with a prepared response. Okay. Do not go into the HSC with a prepared response, particularly for Section 3. I'm talking primarily about Section 3, um, but um, are you guys done with the Section 3 thing as yet? No, forgive me if I'm just repeating what's there. Okay. Two, do not panic when you get into the exam room, okay? You will open up your exam paper and you might find a question that's very straightforward and very easy and you're fine. But you might find something you do not expect. Don't panic. Believe it or not, you actually know it. In here, locked away somewhere, is the answer to the question that you'll find in front of you. Okay? You will be well prepared, so don't worry about that. You know it. What you do... Particularly, as I said, if you get a question that's straightforward about person, uh, ethics or practice, and there have been some of those, you shouldn't have too much trouble, but you do need to read it very carefully, the question. If you get one of those general questions that talks about living religious tradition or whatever, and you've got or there's some weird diagram or quotation there you can't understand, again, don't panic. Whip out your faithful highlighter, which I hope you're taking to the exam room, you look at your quotation, your stimulus or your diagram. You go through and highlight the key words. To be perfectly honest, it doesn't matter a lot whether or not you understand the quotation, okay? As long as you can pick out those key phrases. I get in trouble for saying that. Um, then you go to the question and you highlight any key terms that are there. Does it talk about beliefs? Does it talk about community? Does it talk about individual? Does it talk about living religious tradition or whatever? Highlight those key terms because when you finish writing your essay, you're going to come back and look at those highlighted words and you're going to ask yourself, have I actually addressed those things as I've gone through my response? Okay. If you've got a wonderfully structured essay and it's got an introduction and body and conclusion and you've realised you've missed something out, again, don't panic. Get out a new page or a new booklet, write the section, put a big asterisk next to it and a big asterisk back there. We can figure it out as markers, okay? Don't worry too much about it. Okay. But before you write a word in your response to your question, stop and think. Now, I will tell you right now, if you get one of those complicated questions and you start writing, as soon as you see the question, by the end of the first page, you've got no idea where you've been or where you're going. And then for the next three pages, you're writing a hell of a lot of rubbish. I know because I mark them, okay? What you do on the first page of your booklet, you open it up, you do a plan. That's right, a plan, okay? It will take you five minutes. It might even, even take you 10 minutes. Oh, you're thinking, I could be writing a response. No, do your plan. Because I will guarantee you, and I don't make many guarantees, if you actually spend five or ten minutes doing a plan, when you start writing your question, you know where you're going and what you will produce will be a hell of a lot better than somebody who just sits down with a pen and starts writing. Okay? Do the plan. Okay? Very, very important. Especially in those complicated HSC questions. As I said, don't panic. You know the answer to it. You've just got to work out as you go along how you do it. 
Remember, we're not after content, not particularly. Obviously, we need to have some kind of idea what you're talking about. What we're looking for is your understanding of how this person or this ethical area or this practice relates to adherence within the religious tradition. And we're looking at your skill at being able to answer the particular question that's being asked. Now, that's hard for us as teachers to teach you, to be perfectly honest. We can give you all the content you like, but teaching you to have that understanding or helping you to gain that understanding, helping you to gain uh, the skills to be able to do a good answer to that is much more difficult for us. The best thing you can do is to practice that yourself. Do some practice papers, um, sit down, even just do a plan, okay? Uh, some teachers don't mark essays anymore. Some teachers will ask their students just to do a plan. So they got an understanding of where that person's going. Okay. All right. About four or five minutes ago. Any questions, anyone? Yes. Okay. So, um, Katib, you know, he's very controversial in the sense yes. that he's called some good and he's called some bad. Yes. If we wrote a response on him, would we be marked down for perhaps taking a more negative approach as to how he impacts? No, not at all. Um, the question is about Sayyid Qutb, who can be considered to be quite a bad influence on Islam as much as a good influence. If you talk about the bad things, are you going to be penalised for that? No, you're not. Because, of course, when, you think, we were actually, when I was actually chairman of the uh, Australian Association for Studies of Religion, there was suggestion that some um, two scholars, Sayyid Qutb and Sayyid, uh, the other the Pakistani guy, um, be dropped from the syllabus. Um, and we actually argued when, that they should not be, Sayyid Madudi, I think it was, um, argued that they should not be dropped from the syllabus because when you think about it, most of the significant people are controversial people, have actually brought a challenge to religious tradition. Depends on your perspective as to whether that's positive or negative. You don't have to write an argument that you think the examiner wants to read. You write your argument for yourself and if that means that person's made a negative contribution on Islam from your perspective, argue your case. You won't be penalised for that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions? Looks like we're on the move. Thank you, everyone.